talking to Matt Aldrich, who's a professor of anesthesiology and is director of the critical care units at, uh, at UCSF Health System. So uh, Matt, why don't you just talk through what you're seeing in the ICUs in terms of, in terms of COVID patients? Sure. Um, we're seeing some increase, uh, particularly over the week, uh, an increase in the number. Um, we uh, currently have six uh, patients in the ICU. I, I would say our experience thus far is with a pretty limited sample size is, is fairly consistent with what I've seen in the literature. Um, I've been cautious to not get overly attached to many of the email threads and anecdotal evidence and anecdotal summaries that I think many of us have seen from around the world and, and rather to look at what is now a fairly substantial, I mean, a somewhat varying quality, but a substantial literature over the last several months. Um, and I think for the most part are the patients that we're seeing and their clinical course is what you would expect um, from, from what I've seen described in, in the literature. Today. I think right now we're seeing a range. We've seen patients who've deteriorated quickly. We've also seen patients who have come in and been managed on high flow nasal cannula for three days and then deteriorated. Um, and these are some of the things that are described. I mean, if you look at what people are talking about, there's been, there was a lot of early caution that these patients all deteriorate quite quickly and, mm -hmm. and that needs to be a driving factor in their care. We've seen some of that, but I wouldn't say that's been by any means um, our experience in the hospital. And I mean, and as you know, having talked to, to, uh, to Armand about um, our better, uh, our respiratory care unit, um, that, We've had a range of experiences there too. Some patients who have required a higher level of care and, and have gotten quite sick um, rapidly, and then other patients who have, who have done well and been discharged home. The literature is describing a fairly high mortality rate for patients who need or sick enough to, with respiratory to need to be intubated. It is, and I and I I yes, and and I will say that for the for the few patients that we've seen that. Um, I mean, it certainly is true that when patients come in and, and get intubated, they are quite ill. Um, Interestingly, though, it's, it also sounds like the threshold for intubation is lower than it is with a typical patient. Is that, is that the way you're playing it here? Well, I think, I think the threshold, I think in part because of the needs with PPE and the coordination of care around that, I think um, that, is, that is true uh, that, um, that we are more cautious. Uh, and I think most places have, have advised that patients that at places that have more experience than we do at this point have advised the cautious approach. I think we've, we've taken that approach. We're, we're mindful of that. Um, but we have used, there are some therapies that other institutions have been reluctant to use, particularly high flow nasal cannula that we have used. Um, I think it's too early to say in terms of outcomes, how helpful that's been. Okay. In terms of other therapies, have, do you, have you worked out a standard protocol in terms of uh, remdesivir or steroids or anything else in the cocktail as opposed to standard treatment for bad ARDS? I think remdesivir is the major. I mean, we've been, we are part of a, um, a national trial, international trial with remdesivir, and we've used that in trying to enroll patients in that. I think we've already enrolled several patients at this point. Mm -hmm. um, so that we've done. Um, we are, um, but I would say our approach, I mean, we, I think we are appropriate cautious in the pharmacologic treatment of this. I mean, if you look around, you look at the literature, and you look at descriptions from around the world, there's been a lot of therapies tried, certainly a lot of use of anti, um, antiviral therapy. Um, I think we appropriately here in collaboration, you know, particularly with our infectious disease group, um, and I know you talked to Annie Lukemeyer, I, I think we've been, from my perspective, in, in the appropriate place on this and not getting too far ahead of ourselves with therapies that just don't have evidence. Um, so it's mainly been remdesivir. There's been some use of, um, um, well, that's really actually, I mean, I'd say pharmacologically really where we've stood. We have been um, making every effort to avoid use of steroids and I'm not aware that we've used steroids. I know if you look at particularly the literature from China, pretty heavy use uh, of steroids in their ARDS population. One paper in, um, I believe it was in, um, JAMA internal medicine that showed potentially some mortality mortality benefit. Although I think there's some issues with um, with that study design, and I wouldn't uh, anchor on that too much. 
Um, the WHO has been has certainly been um, consistent in their two clinical uh, management uh, guidelines that they have re released. The most recent one, I believe, in mid March, in cautioning against the use of steroids. Um, partly, as I understand it, driven by prior experiences uh, with with SARS and MERS. So we've not, but but we're also an institution that has not been particularly favorable in our view of, of steroids and ARDS anyhow. There are mm -hmm. certainly a number of ICUs around the world that have been much more liberal in their use, and that's not been, you know, our group of intensivists and ARDS experts, including Michael Mathe, have never been particularly um, enthusiastic about the benefits of steroids. So that, I think that also shapes our approach. And if we were an institution that was inclined to use steroids for ARDS, we probably would have done much the same as has been done already in China and other places, but for, for us, no. Talk about ventilators for a second. How many do we have? How many did we, did we discover in the basement or the ones yes. that, do they actually work? So, so can, a, yeah. can put a patient uh, on, uh, can, can two patients be on a ventilator? All those sort of questions. These are all interesting questions and certainly has been, it's the ventilator supply and, and um, supply demand mismatch has been a, a serious topic and been covered aggressively in social media and print media and um, uh, CNN has covered this aggressively over the last few days. Uh, a couple we're thoughts coming, that I have. We're coming to you for the truth. <laughs> yeah, so a couple yeah. thoughts that I have. One is from UCSF alone, we are actually, I think, in reasonable shape. Now, reasonable shape right now could be very different in the setting of an extreme surge situation, but we had a good stock of fully functional ICU ventilators, um, and we have been tracking this for several weeks now with a morning report that gives us a summary across the ventilators that we use both in the children's hospital and the adult hospital. Um, and so we have been tracking that uh, regularly uh, at this point. Um, and we've got a decent backup supply of ventilators. These are not emergency ventilators that are in the basement that we have to dust off. These are regular ICU ventilators that are part of our regular rotations for which we have ample circuits, filters, parts, et cetera. And was that, we have Matt, was that because somebody anticipates a surge in planning or because you buy a newer model and the older ones sort of get parked or you have to deal with you know wear and tear why did we have an extra supply so i i it's a good question i don't partly i think it was just our institutional approach which i think has overall been quite a solid approach to supply chain logistics and the way we think about clinical engineering and material services has guided our our approach to this. So I, I can't speak to that as well and whether all those people had you know, sat down five years ago and thought about this. Um, we buy ventilators, I think looking at, you know, we, when we purchased our new fleet of, uh, of adult ventilators, for instance, I think this was looking at current average daily use and then buying more than that by X percentage. And I wasn't, uh, I, I can't, certainly can't take any credit that I was, you know, six years ago, anticipating um, this kind of situation and, sure. and arguing for, you know, 100% increase on our current vent supply. Fortunately, we ended up in a position where we've got, you know, on a regular basis sort of approximately double available what we have in use, if not more. Hmm. Um, so that's helpful. We also have a reasonable supply of other types of ventilators that can be used, and that includes transport ventilators that can be um, used with a filter uh, in a situation like this with COVID-19. Um, so that has put us in a good position. We also have early on in this process, um, again, credit to supply chain folks and, and material services, you know, they started a conversation. We all started discussing what between critical care and respiratory care services and supply chain folks started talking about what we needed to do. So we put in a substantial new order a few weeks ago um, for ventilators. And so I'm assuming that these are ventilators that as I understand it are manufactured in Europe, assuming that we don't run into any major supply line or production line issues in Europe, I'm hopeful that we'll get those within, you know, rolling shipments within a few weeks. So that will further bolster our supply of ventilators. And then I think the next step with this would be looking at what other, what other supplies we have available. And so we've been also discussing with our perioperative colleagues and looking at the, at the use of OR ventilators. This is something that I know has already been used, um, or at least I've heard it's already been used in New York City um, at academic medical centers there, where their early planning as they experienced surge conditions included um, 
expanding into the into the perioperative environment, especially once the elective cases were canceled. Uh, it gave them access to, to ventilators. And the standard anesthesia machine in ROR's has a sophisticated ventilator. Mm -hmm. um, we don't have experience using those for critically ill patients. It's not what we've had to ever do before. But in our discussions, we believe that's a viable alternative, either to, to manage the patients within the OR setting in OR rooms or to take those ventilators into other locations where they can be hooked up to a gas supply um, with a, a, a suction port and essentially we're, we're able to use these ventilators. These are far more sophisticated. You can use a, can you use a ventilator in a, in a non-IC room, in a regular med surge room? Does it have the... So, no, you, I mean, that's where the, the benefits of the OR, because the ORs often have two hookups. They essentially, you can, so you can flip the room, essentially, in, in many of our ORs. So, um, so you actually have two OR, uh, two hookups in, in many of our operating rooms. The PACU has hookups uh, as well, uh, where we can place a ventilator. So it gives us options both to either create a separate unit within the PACU, to use the ORs as ICU rooms, essentially, and then staff those. And, you know, if you look at, us, for instance, at UCSF, I mean, that amounts for an additional 90, um, 90 or so ventil uh, ventilators that we could use in our system. Yeah. Um, so that- How about the, uh, the, the, the two people to a ventilator thing? So, you know, that's been an interesting concept. I, I, um, I, I've read uh, sort of the, <laughs> the most prominent paper on this topic. Um, I have seen the blog posts that many people have seen uh, on this topic, and I've read some of the articles and certainly been on email threads around this. Um, I, interesting idea, I've, um, I, for us at least, that's not going to be a path that we pursue um, as, um, as a major component of our backup plan. I, I think there are too many potential risks. Um, I do think we have other options. Um, I'm not aware of any aware of some anecdotal evidence of, of uh, um, temporary use uh, in trauma uh, mm -hmm. situations. I, um, again, I can't verify all this information, but that's what I've heard. But I'm certainly not aware of any published accounts, peer-reviewed accounts of use of these in a disaster situation uh, with, with good outcomes. So yeah. I certainly understand. Yeah. What's that? Sorry, Bob. We hope we don't get there, but yeah. yeah, we do hope we don't get there. I think this has been, you know, it, certainly I understand why people are pursuing this as an idea. And I think like many other, no reason not to look at every option, but based on our initial review and discussion with our respiratory therapy colleagues um, and other intensivists, uh, we have not found that this is going to be our, a core part of our approach by any means. What are the, what are the PPE issues that are, that dominate the discussions in the ICUs? Yeah, I mean, we're, again, I mean, I think we're somewhat fortunate. I mean, in, in part because of planning here, um, we are in better shape than many institutions. I think our air, PPE for airborne precautions, we're actually in reasonable shape uh, at this point um, through a lot of effort. Again, I mean, I think we find a consistent theme is there's been a lot of people working behind the scenes who have done a lot of work to find new sources. There's been, you know, a robust, uh, um, donor response. I mean, various people, I mean, you, you know this, I mean, everything from a handful of N95s that people had in their closet um, from the wildfires to really substantial thousands and thousands of, uh, of N95s donated in a, in a shipment. So we are in better shape than most. Um, I think we're all tracking this and there's all different categories. There's the regular surgical mask and, and it seems, seems to vary some over time. You know, it, Sometimes our supply of N95s is more concerning than other times of surgical masks. Um, gowns are an ongoing issue. Um, again, this is another very controversial uh, area where people have lots of concerns about what the optimal uh, level of protection is. I think for us, certainly in critical care and for air aerosol generating procedures, we have the equipment uh, between PAPRs um, uh, with a face shield, although the face shields have been in low supply. We, we have that option plus N95s with eye protection. Um, we do have a current supply of gowns. So I believe that we're able to keep the nurses and respiratory therapists and intensivists and our trainees safe as we perform the procedures and take care of the patients in the way that we need to. Yeah. So I think overall, it's, I don't think anybody who's in this at any place in the country or in the world for that matter ever feels comfortable with this. And I think there's always the fear that, you know, projected at projected use rates, we have three weeks supply of 
one particular type of PPE, and then if your use rate changes dramatically, which it could in service condition, that three week supply could go down to a one week supply or a four day supply quickly. So I don't, I don't think it's possible to feel comfortable, but I would say we're in better, better shape than most. And it's seeming like we may not get there, but it's too early to say. <coughs> as you think about, <coughs> as you think about people in New York or Italy, and I know you've been in touch with colleagues. Mm -hmm. What have you learned about these, you know, the sort of doomsday scenarios that uh, that you know you have more patients than we have room for, than we have ventilators right. for, and right. you've got to make these tough choices. We've had the luxury of a little bit of a little bit more time to think about it. And maybe we'll never get there, but how how has what you've learned from others' experience influenced your approach here, or what you think our approach might be if it ever happened? Uh, I mean, the first thing I'd say is it's just it's devastating. I mean, I think it's hard for. Um, for any of us to imagine, uh, certainly any of us you know, living in San Francisco or living in the United States, um, you know, and obviously as it gets closer, it's just many of us just know people. So I think, you know, we've had some colleagues early on who who had friends um, and and colleagues, research colleagues, and otherwise in in China and Wuhan, and so we had some early information from there. But then I think we have a growing number of of people here who who know and have done work with people in Italy and in Milan. And, and so the accounts become increasingly personal. And then certainly as we've gotten to New York City and seen what they've experienced, there are just that many more of us who happen to have college or trained with someone who's at Columbia or NYU or, uh, or Cornell. And so I think it just becomes that much uh, more present in our lives. And it's not that hard for us to think anymore about, about what this could be like for us. Yeah. So, um, we've had, you're right, we've had some luxury of time here. Um, and, you know, in part, you know, I think we've all shared this opinion. I, I certainly, living in San Francisco, I'm, I'm grateful to live in the city and to live in a city and an account, a regional area where, you know, seven counties agreed on an approach and, and then in a state that, you know, had the kind of leadership that made the changes that we all hope will make this different for us and, and so that we'll never encounter what New York or Italy encountered. So I'm so hopeful for that. I, again, like PPE, you never feel comfortable. Yeah, um, yeah. I think we're all hopeful for that. Um, we're working through this. We've worked with our, we have a multidisciplinary clinical planning group um, that is uh, growing and large and, mm -hmm. and with enthusiastic participation. And, and um, in that group, we've discussed this scenario. We have worked closely with, with our ethics um, our ethics committee and, and uh, Sarisha and Ariana is the chair and she's been terrific in working with us uh, on this. And so we have, UCSF has developed a sort of framework of ethical principles about how we would approach this. I think the next step and what we're working on with, with the other UCs in, this, in an effort led by, um, led by UCOP is to develop, a, um, develop an approach, a more, what would ultimately need to be a more practical approach for how we would, how we would distribute scarce resources. Um, and allocate those kind of resources in the situation that New York has encountered in other places. So I don't have specifics on that yet. I think many of us have seen the um, have seen some of the the, the tools that have been developed. Um, UPMC has developed a tool. Maryland has adopted a tool. I think the challenge with all of that um, is that uh, these are often processes that occur over months to years to really develop a, an approach to the allocation of. of medical resources is something that necessarily warrants careful consideration, you know, really developing the right kind of stakeholder group, community engagement. And I think because of the situation that we're in, we're going to just by necessity have to accelerate that process. And so I think the one thing that we at least can, can take some um, comfort in is that this process is occurring in conjunction with the other UCs and that we're really able to draw on the expertise um, from other institutions. Well, let's hope we don't get there. Yes. I'm sorry, my pager just went off there in the yeah, background. That's fine. Uh, uh, just to demonstrate yeah. that you're actually a real doctor <laughs> in your work. Well, <laughs> page me. Well, I'm here. Um, thank you for everything you're doing. It's really sure. remarkable and remarkable to see the teamwork coming together. Yeah. And we'll just hope that we don't hit that uh, hit that surge and uh, but the preparation for it has been really impressive and you've been well so. thank you i mean honestly there's there's a lot of you know we've all been at this for for many weeks now and and there's a lot more work to do it's you know i think 
we've all talked about this before. I think it's times like this where you're just grateful for I mean, certainly to work in an institution like this. And, and so, you know, there's just a tremendous amount of work that's being done in all sorts of areas. And some people sort of, uh, the work that they're doing is more prominent just by nature of the work. And then for other people, there's a lot of behind the scenes uh, work. That yeah. I mean, who, who thought that, you know, the, the, the heroism of the people on the supply chain. I mean, I think one of the things it's done is sort of un unearth these unsung heroes who right. probably do this stuff every day. And, and they do it quietly and they take care of it. And we just assume, right, that yeah. things are going to show up and we'll go to the supply room and it's there. And, and you know, that's what really matters for us. And so I really, yeah, I, I'm grateful for that. I think all of us, particularly in the ICU, but across the hospital are grateful for that. Right. All right, I'll let you get back to work. Thanks so right, much. Bob. Thanks. Okay, good to talk.